We made this. Welcome to the Starlight Ballroom. Hey! Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shipwrecked and Comatose, a Red Dwarf podcast on the We Made This Podcast Network and our continuing coverage of the three million years into uh, deep space, otherwise known as the Red Dwarf documentary. And this episode is um, called In Studio Space, No One Can Hear You Scream. And to talk about this episode, which aired yesterday, which was the 13th of August, 2020, is uh, Matt Latham again. Matt, how are you doing, mate? How's, how's your week been since we last spoke? i um, been okay. I've been back at work. So, uh, yeah. Marvellous. So yeah, so it's been work. <laughs> <laughs> have, have you been actually off work as well during the coronavirus or is this your first going back then or have you been I, I've back been, work for a while? I've been in and out um uh, before two weeks um uh, like, like in and out before i had two weeks off now last week was my second week of my two week my annual leave so i've been back in but um i've now back in properly now um like the last don't know how many weeks before my two weeks annual leave i was in one week off the other kind of alternating with the guy i share an office with but we're both back in now so yeah i mean uh, obviously everyone's got a story i mean mine personally is that i haven't stopped um right through but having said that there has been um the uh the fact that i've been doing things that i don't, wouldn't normally do and I'm still getting a bit of that, but I'm actually back into the office where I actually reside as of like last week. So even though we're not back to anywhere near normality in my my potential, my actual work, I am actually back in a place where I'm used to. And there's, there's similar things happening than what would happen when I'm at work. So it is, it is getting back to some kind of normality, although... You know, there's a long, long way to go yet, I think. So, um, but yeah, so we anyway, so we watched, um, you watch, you actually did watch The Three Million Years uh, on watched, time this week. I watched it last week. I was only an hour off. I know. And now we're on one minute off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, okay, that, uh, this is what we're here to talk about. So we might as well just jump straight in. So what did you make of this week compared to last week? I think I learned more this week. Um, right. Th- but there was a lot more. There was a, the. Stru- I mean, it, it completely threw me because it completely structured itself in a way I wasn't expecting, considering what happened, yeah. what it was structured last week. Um, but I, really, I, I enjoyed it. I think a lot more. Um, I learned a lot more, um, and it was just slightly, slightly more entertaining. And a few things that niggled me last week wasn't there, uh, weren't there um, this week, yeah. and. Um, so yeah, it was a lot more enjoyable. I think hurt you. Yeah, I I thought I enjoyed it a lot more. I think I tweeted out halfway through the show actually saying you know it's, it was um, I'm enjoying this a lot more. It it definitely as I kind of predicted last week. It felt like that was more like the introductory episodes for people who are not used to it. This felt more like conversation. Listen, you pointed out last week about the um, the actual promised land recording. Yeah. And I like the fact that they um, they talked, and we'll probably get into it a bit later on. But they ha- we went back to that, and then we, but we also went back to Pinewood Studios, and Danny John Jules came out and spoke to the costume designer and things, which uh, which felt more natural. And I, I quite liked I quite liked that aspect of it. Um, I am disappointed that we our game failed miserably. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was like I was there going like, oh, uh, about halfway through, I'm like. Yeah, I've not heard any licensed music that isn't part of the Red Dwarf score. I'm like, oh, yeah. God damn it. It was a sort of score that um, Shipwrecked and Comatose could have come with, actually, because there was very similar synthy, poppy kind of stuff in there, wasn't there? Yeah, um, yeah. It's almost but, like they took a cue from us. But yeah, I mean, I, I, we was, I was going off the basis that there was still going to go through chronologically through the series, because that's the impression that we got. Mm. last week so it was going okay it was in the 80s so we built the 80s so we're going to get to the 90s now that's why we that's why i assumed there was going to be the incidental music well yeah the incidental music from the time but we didn't get any no and it only it still had a slight it definitely was in the background a slight like 
move on into the the episodes because they kind of when they went through the the alternative uh, alternate like versions of Lister and, and Rimmer and the like that it was they were doing the episodes in kind of chronological order but they just snuck it in it wasn't more like and in season five episode um you know angels and demons it was just like oh we're basing it on the alternate diver um, alternate versions of each of the characters um, so it felt like it was slowly building up there, but it, it was definitely more in the background. I thought that would have been a bit more front and centre, really, but it, it just felt that, you know, they were focusing more on subject matter than anything else, because obviously we had the we had the uh, the alternate um, issue, and we had the uh, the, the space, um, the, the, the ship building and, and the stuff like that, which we'll get into. But yeah, it did, it, it did go different places I wasn't expecting, I must admit. Yeah, same. I mean... Um... And one thing, one thing I noticed as well was that there was a, I was going to say a lot less talking heads, but there was talking heads, but there was a lot more relevant talking heads. Um, yeah. There's, I can probably count on one hand, um, space filler, I could say, where you suddenly had, I think, Katie Brand and Nish Kumar turn up for one, mm. for one talking head for 15 seconds for no apparent reason. So, yeah. it, I mean, I, 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 still, I can't figure out why they're, would have to have had they had to have shown considering they had a lot of talk from Ed by the cast themselves um uh, the costume designer whose name escapes me the set designer um as well yeah so there was a lot more relevant people talking I felt rather than the I love the 80s style talking heads yeah. so it felt more cohesive and that it looked like it like they hadn't they had enough insider stuff inside yeah. their talking heads to actually fill the hour. So I quite liked that. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely felt more blocked, didn't it? It was it was more like you know we're going to talk to talk about you know the the, the models and Starbug now, and we're going to talk about this now. So one of the things that I, that I picked up actually was the um, the costume designer was Howard Burden. Um, so that scene, uh, we could talk about Cat, I think, because the um, that was <laughs> I quite liked when they were talking at Pinewood that you know Danny John Jules is the only character that or the only person that's not changed size. <laughs> that, was, that was a very nice way of putting it, I think. <laughs> yes, it was. It was. Um, but yeah, I mean, but, but even like the little um, things, like the colouring in of the, the zebra thing, because he didn't have that much money. I thought that stuff like that was like, oh right, that's interesting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, cause they. But didn't they just reuse the same zebra skin? Yeah. And just paint, yeah, and just like cover him with like marker pen, which was ridiculous. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, particularly at the at the four of them, the um, the the costumes. I think the cat was the one that probably <laughs> was probably the one that had the most focus on it. But I never actually realised that there was that much of a departure from well. Obviously, okay. Um, from two to three, yeah. I mean, I like the kind of look and the the clothes and the fashion of the characters that changed. I mean, the obvious one is Rimmer because they go from the grey, the grey uniforms to co- kind of subvert, like kind of establishing the colour code for the light system. So he's kind of soft light green, and um for number th- for series three and I now actually realised that they had kind of changed Lister's look into the kind of that biker leather jacket yeah. into season yeah. three I, I, I never clocked on her no I, it, it, it is strange it, it's it's obvious when you see it but you know thinking back to it it, it was generally his uh, you know his mustard stained t-shirts or his gold jets t-shirts and things like that wasn't it that that you would you would generally see in the first couple of seasons because he, he, he wears a hat, doesn't he, in the first two? And I can't remember if he doesn't wear it in the third onwards. Because I'm sure because he... He, cause he, he, wears, often... he, he definitely wears the hat when he gets that disease on his head, doesn't he? Yeah. And he explodes. He's definitely wearing it then. Um, I'm not too sure. But, but you're right. It is the fact that, you know, they've, they've gone, I'll tell you what, we'll go all out there, make him like a biker, arts, college kind of graduate kind of thing. Um, and and it's the same with the music. It's just, I, I think I've mentioned this somewhere else, but... The uh, the theme tune, it did not dawn on me, even, even watching it all in all these years, that when I watch a season one, season two episode, that the theme music is different. It was just like, it's, it just becomes part of the tapestry, and I don't really think about it. But then when you get it pointed out to you, and this was before this documentary, 
about the theme tune changing. I was like, oh, I, oh, hang on a second. Of course it is. And then you think about the way they were talking about season three here, that, you know, the whole thing, the whole aspect, the whole design and the look and the style changed. And season three became, you know, I mean, you think about the Red Dwarf theme tune for the, for the opening. It's, it almost sets you up ready for the show, whereas the other one was kind of di- um, kind of a, a dystopian kind of theme tune. You know, like it was a, you know, really grand and, and you know, dark and, and dingy. But it, but again, it was, it, 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 thinking back to it now, it feels like it's uh, counterproductive in the way that it is, whereas the newer theme tune from season three onwards makes much more sense. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I mean, I, I clocked onto that like years and years and years ago when I think I started watching when I saw the first ep- well, episode from the first two series, and I remember what, like watching for the first time, and I'm like, okay, the intro is different, and it's this slow kind of do 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 do. Which yeah. I think, which is, is still technically the the main theme, because I think I think it's kind of retrofitted now that 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 it kind of goes into that. Mm, yeah, it, it goes through that, and then it kind of then builds into the dun 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 dun, dun bit, and then into the full rock version of it. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's just because it, it feels like by season three and. Try not to talk about in specifics because we, we, <laughs> else we'll be saying, "Oh, we covered this in the three million years." When we get to <laughs> yeah, the episodes yeah. in, in general, but yeah, the, I think the kind of umph in production value. Uh, well, I say umph. It was probably just an extra few pence to find <laughs> pennies to find yeah. down the side of the. So it kind of like it kind of echoed through every for everything, and this kind of and this and this episode kind of like covered how much it was like a shot in the arm to mm. the look of Red Dwarf and the sound of Red Dwarf that I think from season three onwards, I think when you think of Red Dwarf, that it, it's it, that was the genesis of basically the look. I mean, because you had the characters there and then, but then as soon as Crichton comes in and everything's on the money, that's when Red Dwarf becomes Red Dwarf. And I think there was... I think... I can't remember, I can't remember the exact quote, but it might have been David Tennant in his voiceover saying that by season by the end of series three... That's when he became a phenomenon. Yeah, and then it started saying. Then I think um, Robert Lowarian says, "When does a cult become a you know becomes <laughs> so?" Because it's like it was massive, and uh, I, I think I agree with you that Red Dwarf to me is that season three onwards look and style, and that's what I think. And I think this is the the issue with with me not knowing, not quite getting that theme music is that I automatically think to like the. You know the three season, uh, especially like the season six, and I know that Gunman and Apocalypse was mentioned at the very end of this, ready for next next episode. But um, it's always the, where I go back to, and I, I don't know if it's because I just didn't watch them in any particular order at that point, and I've what one and two may have been like much later on, and it just goes in the mix, and it had I haven't realised I haven't watched it maybe like sequentially for so long that I just stick a red dwarf on and watch them. Um, and I've probably watched more season three to six in that in the, in the short space of time, and I didn't. I don't think I've really done a rewatch as in like literally from like what we're doing now from one to twelve, like sequentially. And it's it's just interesting that we we forget things like that. Oh, I'll, um, say, I'll say say that I do. I mean, as rewatching series two, I I think series two is a lot strong as like it's a lot stronger in places than perhaps I remember it being because I don't there's no good in that series at all yeah whereas yeah. I, I think it's very consistently high season and that's probably down to some of the low key story characters but it was the first time it was the first time it was kind of delving into science fiction it just didn't have the production value so I think you can kind of see the ambition of future series show in series two yeah oh yeah definitely so like because yeah. so like you, you had like stuff like um uh, like a parallel universe and um like at the end of the end of the series and stuff and like Crichton turning up and so you kind of had so the ambition was there so I think it was only until they had that extra few pennies that it was <laughs> finally realised yeah I'll tell you another thing as well that I mean we've talked about cat, cat costumes and um, they then uh, they only very briefly went on to Crichton, and when they were talking about the general design, because obviously he's a mechanoid and that's it. But then they started talking about his um, his mask and stuff, and 
some of the analogy of like wearing a hot water bottle on your head for 12 hours it was uh was uh, actually quite good actually because I, I thinking about having a hot water bottle over your head is uh it's quite um it's quite scary really. i'm not a fan i'm not a fan of being knocked out and um, when, I, when I went to the dentist, I always, always remember saying, I want an injection, I want an injection, don't don't put a rubber mask on me. And they did towards the end. And I thought I was like struggling, like fuck, basically, just like, no, get off me, get off me. And apparently my arms were just like sort of just swooning around it slowly. <laughs> um, but they put the mask on me and I didn't like it. And that kind of took me back to that. And just thinking of having this hot water bottle on your head for so long. And um I, I like the, the bringing into the sea, the season 12 stuff where, you know, I think it's Siliconia where, um, you know, I mean, I know, again, Mark obviously hasn't seen these yet, but um, the the fact that they got a chance to like envisage what that was. And I, I quite like, I quite liked the, uh, you know, talking about the, the scene, what the, I think it was Ed By talking with the water when he, all, all that Robert Llewellyn did was push his face and water would come out. And then we got an actual visual of Craig Charles, like, tipping his head to one side, and I was like, oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and I, I, I mean, there's probably been quite a few different um, interviews about this now where they were talking about, because, uh, oh, is this is this uh, Rob Llewellyn getting his revenge or anything? Mm. And, um, but I think for the, this, apparently for, like, 30 years, apparently they've been giving him grief, saying, oh, man up, man up, it's only a mask. And, and a lot, <laughs> I think a lot of them have got a better appreciation for basically what he's had to go through to put that mask on. And, yeah. and I did quite like the um, there's two two things actually about that that um, from Craig Charles. One was during the basically discussion on the set of Starbug, where they're saying the, that him and Dan, Danny John Jules would be like coming in for a night out on the lash at the Hacienda in Manchester at five a.m. five a.m. to and get some few hours sleep for the call sheet, and then Robert Llewellyn was waking up ready to go into makeup. Yeah, I, I picked that up. I, I made a, a, a note on that because I definitely wanted to bring that up because it's like, I, I can you imagine, I'm just imagining like Craig Charles and Danny John Jules and uh, Chris Barry all going out and going to Hacienda. And, you know, as, as he mentions, like Happy Mondays and stuff like that, right at the, the peak of like, you know, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And the fact that Robert Llewellyn's having to go in at that time in the morning. And they were actually saying that they actually think they did pass at one point. It's just like, that must be so, so bizarre. And so like pissed off you would be the fact that you're going into work and you're made to like sort of, um, sort of running against the walls and going back to the hotel room and stuff. Yeah. But then I think um, Craig Charles was then saying, was like, but pff, he's, pff, he's made loads out of it. So I don't know what he's complaining about. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's like uh, yeah, you've, you've had a, you've had enough with a man behind the mask box. So like, <laughs> yeah, it's like a, uh, God, he's God, he's made a mint out of it. So I don't know what he's moaning about. But I, I, th- I think they said like it, it's gotten a lot easier to apply the mask throughout the years because isn't it down to like five hours rather than eleven? <laughs> yeah, he he said five or six hours. That that's what he said on the on the thing. But I'm sure that they've said it took longer because even the the the. The actual cast was saying, wasn't it about eight, nine hours? And they said, no, it's five or six. So I'm not too sure. It definitely reduced in, in time now because it's more of like, a you know, the way things have changed. And maybe like four hours or something, three hours maybe. Um, but I thought I thought it was longer than what he said. So I would have to look into that and see um, and see what the, what, the, what the actual or what other quotes have been on that. Because it might even be on the Red Dwarf book I've got, actually, that have said, that said how long it take, took. But, that, but it was interesting. Um, yeah, and so so they get round that. So they talk about you know the, the sort of the costumes and 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 that. And and I liked I liked it again the fact that it was all during the Promised Land thing. They were just chatting, and I think they mentioned it as well with Tony Hawks. Um, when they're talking about Tony Hawks with such affection, saying he's basically the sixth dwarfer and and uh, the Calicula stuff, uh, I thought was was quite was quite a nice touch. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I yeah, see. I quite like that because I think uh, when he basically just kept like sl- kept slapping Craig Charles in the face um, repeatedly, in the back. and I think actually in the clip you can kind of see Danny John Jules as a cat trying not to laugh as well. <laughs> it's the, yeah, and I didn't actually, I never actually realised Tony Hawk was like the hype man. I know he'd been in. Cause I think didn't he do the voice 
doesn't he do a voice of a robot or two? Just talky toaster. Yeah, talky toaster as well. But yeah, yeah, I didn't realise he was the the hype man or the warm guy either. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I, we've just we've talked about that on the podcast um, early doors. I think we we're talk, uh, talking about that because I got Tony Hawk's mixed up completely when we talked about the toaster. I remember I remember talking about that, and I think I got. I can't remember exactly how, how or why or who I was getting him mixed up with. Um, but it was quite embarrassing. I was like, it's probably on record, I think. I'm like, oh, no, I've got that wrong. <laughs> um, but never mind. Oh, I might have cut it out, and this is the use of exclusive. So, you know, we all get things wrong. Um, but, yeah, and, and there was a few little um, outtakes as well, which, which was in here as well, like the lean-in thing with, when they were talking about the audience, uh, which and, and, and they just, and I don't think, do you think, I don't think we're going to get any more than this, but they just mentioned seven and nine, not having an audience, and that was it. There was, like, no, like, other information about that whatsoever it's like apart from seven and nine we've always had an audience it was like all right okay um so yeah. i don't know i don't where do you think we're gonna go next because this one threw me a bit of a loop as as, as we mentioned at the top of the hour there that you know we were expected to go one way and now they're going to talk about the science they're going to talk about gunman and the apocalypse um i don't know what else there was what else were they looking at there was something else there were um guest stars Guest stars, yes. I'm not entirely sure where where we're, I don't think we're going to touch upon much of seven, eight, and nine. I don't. Well, maybe maybe back to earth and the new stuff, but I, I don't know if we're going to get it all in that last hour. Uh, no, it's a shame as well. I think because they've still got got the talking heads for um, Mac McDonald. Um, yeah, as well. And oh yeah, so it could we could still get a bit of eight. I think that'll probably end up being to do with the guest stars and the so they'll probably end up talking about the growing cast and um, I'm 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 going to resign myself that we probably won't get a full a, f- a full good chunk dedicated to the character Kachansky even though I do think she and I do think they should be should actually give her some exploration of her but um, I, I think it's a big miss if they don't mention because uh, she's not really a guest I wouldn't would you class her as a guest star? well I suppose you would class her as a guest star wouldn't you. Yeah, um, I mean seven. Seven, you pretty much she's she's a, a member of the cast. So, and she, well, let's so let's hope. Let's yeah, hope. Well, she's one. She's the main one of the main characters in eight as well. So, well, well, yeah, yeah, of course she is. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's hope that we do. As 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 we mentioned last last week, that we get a bit of um, Chloe Annette and you know Claire Grogan would be would be amazing. Going back to like the whole thing, I really like the stuff about the. About the relationship with the studio audience as well, because there's because I was talking about because I was talking about uh, at one point how it was like hard to remember lines and stuff, and I remember thinking while watching it, going, "Well, surely if you approach it like it would apply, it'd be easier because you have to do the but like because you, you can't have because you you'll go to the theatre and you can't expect the theatre actors to mess up their lines and go whoopsie." But um, yeah. but one thing, but the one thing that really struck me, I think it was Danny John Jules that said that there was points where like they'll start recording and nothing was hitting in terms of jokes, and like yeah. it wasn't explicitly said, but the idea was that like as soon as you fluff a line, it would loosen up and relax everyone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think the suggestion was that they probably want well, perhaps once or twice kind of faked. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I don't. It wasn't explicitly said, but they might have faked a, a smeg up. Just to kind of break the ice and tension. Yeah, well, do you know what? I mean, it instantly pulled me back to a smeg up where um, I think R- Rimmer says something and he turns around and Chris Barry turns around to the screen and says, "I've got a messed up." And the very first line of the show, and I wrote, and that instantly jumped to me. I was like, "Oh right, are they meaning something like that?" Um, yeah, it did feel that that did pick up to me actually thinking about it that um oh and also i've just seen a note by the way which i just have to mention right now they mentioned laughter the summer why <laughs> <laughs> uh I, honest to god i was laughing just purely on the back of our conversation last week when the when they mentioned it about the special effects i thought it was brilliant we'll come into special effects in a minute but um but yeah I, I, it is that is interesting that you as you say it, it almost like loosened them up um, it, um, I didn't think about it in the way you're thinking about it, actually. But yeah, I could, I could imagine them maybe, you know, like forgetting to lean, for example, like they showed on on see on the later season, where they like sort of lean into one side and and Chris Barry doesn't go, and she went, oh, I'm meant to lean, Anna. I can imagine something like that maybe picking up. So, yeah, but I, I do. I mean, I, I've never seen. I'd love to have been to 
to go to recording, but I've never been to a sitcom recording, so it'd, it'd probably be very weird. But I'm assuming a lot of... Because you probably... Cause I can't see it ever being, like, filmed sequentially in normal order. I don't know how it works, but... Mm. I mean, you might... They must be. I mean, they must like realize that they're not going to get a full kind of narrative when they go and view it. So they must try and make it as entertaining as possible. So, and I think, yeah. they, and they did decide that the audience probably expects the smeg ups, and that's the entertaining. So, like, if they go in to see a recording, then at least if they can kind of see the the actors enjoying themselves when they mess up, then that's. Yeah. I think that's more of a a good time. It gives the audience a, be- a good time rather than just like seeing. Bam, 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 scene, 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 laugh, 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 and in an order that they probably wouldn't really understand because they might be shooting yeah. the things in order. They never, actually, they never actually mentioned anything about that, which, well, like in terms of like the blocking and breaking yeah. of the story and how they film it. It's, it's probably not as interesting, but well, yeah, that would be not. interesting for us probably. But. Yeah. So, um, like, I mean, if any if anyone's listening who's either um, who's gone to see Red Dwarf be recorded live or any sitcom live, actually, please get in touch because that's something I'm quite fascinated about, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I actually applied for tickets for ten, I think, and I, I obviously didn't get them. Um, and I think I must have applied for tickets for eleven and twelve because I remember eleven and twelve. I think they were being filmed in november and february of that of like over the course of like those six months um and i didn't get any of that time as well so i definitely apply for 11 and 12 10 11 and 12 um i think i've seen somewhere i think i've seen somewhere where they do see they do film scenes and you'll have the floor manager say what what the lead up is to it so they'll say like you know well so we're just in we're just in starbuck at the moment they've just um left red dwarf and this has happened and then they'll say and, and we're in the part now where Lister is 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 thinking about um, what to say to Cat about the fact that he you know he might have to go undergo an operation. This is just me making it up, and then that's then then it's like play scene kind of thing. So I think there's a lot of like floor manager narrating, and I don't know where I've got that from, but I, I kind of remember seeing something along those lines. Yeah, the um, and they also had there's a bit of well not loads, but they did dedicate some talk about Marooned, which was um, yeah, and like the fact it was like a two way. Street, two way street, and how that was before, how they had to do that with um, handheld cameras, yeah, well, yeah. well with the studio audience, and how they made of that. So, the bit with the handheld cameras, I never noticed before, actually. I never yeah. noticed that, yeah, it's that cla- claustrophobic kind of thing, isn't it? I, I've always, it always like stands out to me with the dog food bit. I always remember that. Um, I didn't realize it was all like that, though. I, I, I thought, I thought there was just maybe there was just that scene. Um, but I like things like that. I like things like looking at Dutch angles and things on camera views and stuff. So I, I tend to pick up on camera stuff. But um, yeah, it's quite. It's, it was quite surprising. I, I didn't realize it was a two handle thing. But what I quite like, and this is something um, that happened in the show as well about um, Red Dwarf, and one of the things I really, really do like about it, and it probably happens in lots of sitcoms, is the, um, you mentioned about the theatre kind of aspect to it. Now, yeah. I think the problem with something like Red Dwarf and learning the lines and stuff is that you don't have the time like you would in a theatre to actually mm-hmm. go through it. So you're you're only maybe going what one table talk, read through, maybe a quick draft through a scene, rehearse through a scene, and then you're on. So there's not like you know your weeks of of going through each bit and you know learning it off by art. So I think the which helps us for the smeg ups obviously, but um but you get scenes like in marooned where you, the playing off the audience or the, the the obvious ones polymorph which they talk about um uh with the with the shorts uh which is it's just an so amazing thing and the fact that they couldn't hear each other which i've never really spotted that before that the fact that they're literally screaming at each other because they can't hear each other yeah chris barry i mean yeah even i think it's even the, the shot they had to use in the episode but chris barry looks like he's trying to fight the urge to break because yeah. he's smirking throughout all that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, I mean, like, you can see Chris, but I mean, it's completely... I, I've always saw, saw that shot as, like, not as uh, in character, but I think it would be physically impossible for Chris Barry to be able to play that as Rimmer would. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. And that, that happens so much. I think there's a scene in, within this, actually, when Holly says something. And he says it, and you can totally tell he's, smir- he's smirking as soon as he says it, <laughs> you know. And and I love that. I, I think it's endearing to be honest. But um, but I always think about uh, of of recent 
um, Red Dwarf history, things like uh, the moose joke. <laughs> where, you know, so, so it ends, I mean, I, hopefully, hopefully, I'm hoping Mark's not listening to this, but when it ends, um, you know, and, and the, the line is delivered, Danny John Jules waits an age for the for the audience to calm down but it's and then he goes i mean i think uh actually i think i've had, i think i bagged bag that episode because i love that's one of my favorite bits of the red, red dwarf but it's the yeah. fact with the it but we can relate it to the studio or the uh the studio audience and i'm pretty sure actually that there was actually a shot of them filming that scene um one of the wide shots i think i'm, I'm, I'm convinced it was one of them but but it's the fact yeah. that um it's it's the fact that the, the the joke had been built built up for like about about fifteen minutes, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. then and they talk about and, it. and over an ad break as well. Yeah, over an ad break. Yeah, yeah. So. and then the cat walks in, and immediately the audience knows what's going to happen and start laughing because they know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, the fact the cat walks in, and like even before Rumi gets the idea, the audience start laughing because the cat walks in, and yeah. I think that really like, and funny enough, it's because the relationship with the studio audience they know the character. They know. Yeah. They can kind of say they know what's kind of gonna happen, and yeah, the, yeah and it's just it, it's the same when like I think particularly particularly in like whenever Holly shows up as a surprise, um, they've always commented that like they can just go out for they can go out for an hour and come back and the audience is still cheering, so it's that it's that kind of thing and um, yeah and it's it's a shame they don't delve on the lack of audience for seven and nine, um, because I would have loved to see how the Perhaps like even if it was just like the cast talking for like thirty seconds about how the relationship, how the relationship and timing changes, because I think whilst I do quite I, I I do do quite like Seven, that aspect does kind of impact back to earth, and you can kind yeah. of feel it, and the relation and the relationship with the audience kind of it it, it, it again like if if, if Tony Hawks is the sixth dwarf, the audience is the seventh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely yeah. I would completely agree with that. And um, but yeah, it, it's um, do you know? I, I think from a, from a balance point of view, it would have been nice rather than just David Tennant just literally just saying, apart from seven and nine, they had they've always had an audience. It's like, right? Well, can we can we maybe have a little bit on on the reasons behind it? You know, or can we have a little bit on? Well, we tried it, it didn't really work, or we tried it, we want it to be more American sitcomy, or whatever it may be, and we're sure we'll talk about that when we get to seven. But it's, um, it just seemed like it was, it was not cheap, but just effective, just to go. Yeah, this is the audience. This is part of what Red Dwarf is. Uh, let's forget seven and nine because obviously they didn't have audiences in and, and move on. Um, you know, um, with the reasons for that, we just, we just don't know. But it, it is interesting how they just kind of just. Uh, when talking about that, they've just skipped over it. What about the special effects? Then I mean, Peter Rag. I mean, I've seen that Peter Rag's son's been tweeting quite quite a lot last night as well, and and I think Ed By or Doug Nail, I think it might have been. Um, it, it was uh, really kind, really saying really kind words for thank you for speaking to my dad in that way and things, which was which was lovely to see. But that, that I I particularly like that because I, I think the way the the built up was like and the special effects, you know, and everyone's probably going to knock you know certain things in red dwarf and you know i saw i did see starbuck and i saw that rimmer was in his costume and i was like i'm getting the action man scene i'm getting it <laughs> and i didn't quite go there i was like oh oh no never mind but um but yeah the thunderbird stuff and the you know captain scarlet and and all, all that and the doctor who stuff as well i thought was uh that was a, a nice little part of that that i really enjoyed that section yeah, definitely. It was um, it was quite nice, and it was it, partic- particularly as well. Like I think a lot of the lo-fi special effects, I think it adds to the charm. I think, like, oh, uh, I agree. Yeah, yeah totally I mean, agree. T- and like, I mean, I mean, like the, the mention about the hologram stuff in the first two. Um, how they got Chris Barry to like kind of like <laughs> pretend to fall through her or just go through a table and stuff, and so yeah, so I quite I quite like they touched on that. Yeah, and I like the, uh, the the blue screen that we get with Craig Charles as well when he, he gives his hand through the through Rimmer in season one, and you see like the, the the fabric of the uh, blue screen when he passes through, and I thought I didn't even think about how that works from like sort of you know having a, a contact through the actual fabric to make it look like he's going through Rimmer, um, you know, and that was only like it's literally a, a, not even a second of seeing that on screen, but it was like. Oh, hang on. Yeah, oh yeah, of course they would need to do that, you know, to to 
display rim around that part and have it have something feel like it was moving as he went through went through his um, hand. So I think I enjoyed that that aspect to it as well. Uh, and I think that they they were generally genuinely in awe of um, of Peter Rag, weren't they? When when they said about Virgil Tracy and actually physically has pictures of him and it's like, well, he can do anything he wants now. You know, it's entirely up to him. You know, he's got we've got the the way that as we mentioned, season three ups the game and they're saying. You know, it's it's such a a big change in in kind of style and look that you know the fact that they've got somebody that that good and um and the fact that he, he knows what he's doing was was kind of like an endearing to them all. Uh, right, Starbug. What what uh, have you seen that? Did you ever see the first Starbug design? Did you have you? I think I've seen that before. I don't know about you. No, that's the first time I saw it. Right. Okay. It it, it just it stood out to me as potentially something. Uh, something that we got on, and we—I know they talked about the. Um, it was a lesser design, and they've built dozens and stuff. It felt like a rip um, off of Thunderbird Four, if I was completely honest. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I could see that. I could see that. Uh, I'm definitely not making Tracy Island though. Let's not. Let's not go down Blue Peter style. <laughs> um, we we do talk about the scutters a little bit, and uh, we've discussed that on the podcast before. I don't think we need to really go through that again. Um, but the alternative. The, 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 when they start to talk about the alternative episodes of things like Polymorph and we've got uh, Back to Reality, they, they talk about that for a little bit. And, of it, the, and then you have to you have to go through the Dwayne Dibley stuff. Um, and this is the, probably the first time that we've ever mentioned Dwayne Dibley on the podcast. No, no, <laughs> which, uh, which which was which was great. Um, but I, I liked I liked the fact that the uh, another Rimmer, which I completely forgot about, and we need to do a special on it. It's alternate versions of Rimmer. Um, I watched a season 12 episode recently and um, I completely forgot there was an, an alternative version of Rimmer in, in that one as well. And uh, and this one, we've got the kind of um, Rocky Horror Show Rimmer, don't we? And it was it was nice to see the uh, Demons and Angels one again because I not completely forgot about the episode, but when it came on, I was like, oh, oh, yes. And then I wanted to, and they didn't, to see the bit where he says, I'm going to have you. And they didn't do that, didn't go that far, which was a shame. Interestingly enough, they did not mention Ace Rimmer. Yes, that is interesting. Yes, they mentioned Dwayne. Yeah, um, but they didn't never clocked Ace Rimmer, which I I'd argue to be the the more popular out of the two between the, him and Dwayne Dibley. Which I found that quite interesting. Then again, that might be my Rimmer bias, but uh... mm. no, I mean Ace. I'm trying to think back to like people in the street that I've seen that generally Ace Rimmer, I would see Ace Rimmer's t-shirt more often than I would do something with Dwayne Barry on it. You'd always see Smoke Me a Kipper. Dwayne Dibley. Uh, yeah, sorry, Dwayne Dibley, yeah. Um, you'd, you'd, always see, you'd always see Smoke Me a Kipper um, with Ace Ventura. Ace Ventura? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, God, you've turned into me. <laughs> yeah. um, with Ace Rimmer. When we see Ace Rimmer... Um, on a T-shirt in the general public, you, I don't see any Dwayne Dibley ones, uh, but Dwayne Dibley seems to get the best response when you see it on the show. I think. Hmm. Definitely. Yeah, but I think I think in terms of character, I think in terms of character, I think there's a lot more potential for Ace. But in terms of character, well, I think we've seen that. I think there's more of a character for Ace than there perhaps is for Dwayne. I think Dwayne Dibley is a very funny joke but i think yeah. ace feels like a, a, a better character like yeah. an actual character rather than just an excuse for for dan john jules to be dorky yeah yeah no i agree with that i'm wondering you know because of the science involved i think next week we're talking about science whether or not dimension jump will be in that mm. because it's alternative realities isn't it yeah so uh, maybe, maybe let's hold let's hold that thought until next week. As my guess would be that Ace Rimmer, they can't they can't not mention Ace Rimmer in a three part documentary about Red Dwarf. They can't. It's not yeah. possible. I mean, it's it's and it's. I mean, and unless yeah, unless they they want to skim out for Chris Barry's um, holiday, but uh, <laughs> holiday in you, <laughs> in series seven. But um, yeah, that that's an inter- it is an interesting one that. I can't see that they're going to have to mention Ace from I can't see them not. I can't see them not mentioning it. It's just it seems to be so a big gap in in the law. Yeah, and it too it's too big a gap in the law. I mean, as I say, having 
I, and I think that thematically talking about, we talk about Danny Jones Jules costumes and then we talk about Dwayne Dibley. So it's like the polar opposite of what we've just been talking about that. And Lit- Rimmer hasn't really been talked about in that sentiment, apart from obviously the, um, the, the fact that he's playing with the hollow whip and stuff. So yeah, that, let, let's, let's, let's park that one for now and then let's see, um, see what happens next week with that. Uh, um, oh, they brought in the uh, Dave Coleman's extraordinary, which I completely forgotten about as well on the Smeg Ups. It's extraordinary, which uh, which I always loved on the um, on on the Smeg Ups and stuff. And and I like the fact that the um, that when they're referring back to some of the Smeg Ups, that uh, Robert Llewellyn came back with the the bag of chips. There's a bag of chips in it for you. The fact that they they remember stuff like that, you know, is it, is it, nice that they kind of hold that um, personally as well. Because you obviously in the in we see it, we know that we've seen those. You know, it's um, there's the classic smeg up where he says, "I've just cacked me pants," <laughs> which is one of my favourite ever smeg ups. Um, and I know it's not a smeg up as such; it's just like stop <laughs> doing it. But that kind of boys from the dwarf kind of feel to it, and the fact that they're remembering things like the bag of chips and stuff is really interesting. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, you know, I don't think I've actually seen any of the smeg ups. Properly, I think I've only ever seen them clips. I never saw any of the actual Smeg Up videos. I don't think. Oh wow! Yeah, well, okay, that, that's going to have to change. Have you did you have you seen the ones I've mentioned? I can't remember. Right. Like, I, I must have, there must there must be some on the DVDs, but I can't remember many of them. Right. Okay. I must, I yeah. Must, I can't remember. Right. Is that that needs to change, Matt? You need. <laughs> yeah. That might be your homework um, to go <laughs> to go through that and come back come back to us. Um. But yeah, I mean, other, other than that, really, it, it felt, I mean, I, I thought this one might be a bit shorter, to be honest, um, this week, because there was a lot of like, just general discussion about, you know, the, the episodes and particular bits. And, and there was a couple of jokes in there. There was about the Hacienda. There was um, some very standard, straightforward stuff, which was really interesting. Um, whereas last week, we had a bit more to talk about, about the style and with which the change, but can you, is there anything else that you wanted to bring up that I, that I might have missed? Um, there was the, I think there's a good quote from, so where Robert Wellen goes, if there's a working prop, Craig Charles hasn't touched it yet. <laughs> 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 and then he's had like a montage of clips of basically things breaking whenever Craig Charles looks at them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, I, I did enjoy that. I, I, I mean, even like some, some of the simples, the one that, where he's walking out with a backpack and he knocks the knocks a little bar that's next to him and it falls behind him. Yeah. You know, a... it's, it's not even that funny, but the, in the context of like him breaking stuff, it makes total sense. There was a bit as well. I think he must have been, I think it looked like it was from back to earth. There was filming and he did something. Can he, you made a joke saying, well, that's a sturdy prop in Danny John Jules Goss. It's been a few years since we've said that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it, yeah. it just must be an ongoing joke that everything breaks. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I yeah, that was brilliant. It was, it was, um, uh, well, yeah, because it, it was on Back to Earth as well, where we saw um, Danny John Jules in his purple lycra kind of swimsuit thing as well, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Uh, that which is just that is, I mean, how on earth he gets away with that? I just don't know. I really, I really don't. But it just works, and it, you know, it is so ludicrous. Right? If you didn't know the cat as a character, it's just ridiculous. But the fact that he gets away with it's amazing. Um, but yeah, I think that that that, that brings it up. Then I think that wraps us um up for this week um so how do we do in the music quiz do we do <laughs> do we do any do we do any very well is there, is there many is there many songs in there are we going to expect any more next week um well at the moment our score is currently nil out of six <laughs> so do you think we'll have any songs next week apart from maybe the om song uh, the rimmer song uh the the Rimmer song, the Rimmer Experience song, but mm. I hope so because that's, I love that bit. But um, yeah, I don't I know. I mean, he's, Ar- he's, he's Arnold Rimmer, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> without him, life would be much dimmer. So um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whether it's just a sit. Let's just keep. Let's have a rollover and see if the, <laughs> the six of yeah. picked. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's let's do that. Let's do that. So we're, we're going to be talking about guest stars. We're going to talk about. Um, you know the the uh, spe- not special effects. So we've got guests. What have we got? So we've got guest stars. We've got um, Gunman of the Apocalypse, which seems to be like because that was the that was Emmy winning, wasn't it? Yes. 
So I, I, I think obviously that is the epitome of what where Red Dwarf was. So the fact that they're going to talk about that is uh, is pertinent, really. And then obviously, you know, which guest stars are going to come? You mentioned um, obviously Hollister, and he does appear in season twelve as well. So um, and he's obviously already been a talking head. So that that so that that pretty much nails him on to be talking about that. Um, yeah, so it, it's going to be it's going to be an interesting one. Uh, next week and just how they're going to wrap things up and what they're what they're going to do what are you looking forward to potentially seeing then because it is a bit up in the air now i thought we might have had more of an idea of what we we're going to expect but yeah i mean it's throwing it up in the air yeah if, if there's going sequentially then i probably would have thought this would have been covering the dave era but i honestly have no idea i mean in terms of in terms of guests, I've got a feeling there'll probably be a focus on the Dave bit because I think the guests are slightly more well known in right, the Dave yeah. era because you've got, say, they said they the highlight um, Johnny, Johnny Vegas. Vegas. There's um, James Buckley. Yeah. James Buckley's in, um, I think, in 11, I think. Yeah, so I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I, I could probably say a whole load of stuff and it won't happen. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. let's just say um, in fact there's an episode on it just say everything that you don't want to happen and that will happen um, I can't that's a that season 12 episode yeah um, where, where everything they say is um, the total opposite happens so um, but yeah maybe in an alternative universe we'll be alright but yeah so that, that well, obviously let's, let's wrap this up then because I think uh, we've run out of things I don't think there's anything else we need to uh, touch upon um, from what I've seen so where can people find you online? And you are going to come back on next week, I hope. And uh, let's let's talk about the final final episode of this uh, three-part documentary series. Yeah. Um, and then we'll talk about basically uh, next week about the um, upcoming season two and where we are with that. But where can people find you online right now? Um, they can find me online um, through my podcast, which is Pick a Disc. And you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter under that name. And you can also follow my new podcast, which is Ask Us About Loom, which follows um, games of the point and click adventure genre. Excellent stuff. And you can find me on Twitter at R Muldrake. It's R M U L D R A K E. Um, and find me on the Xcast as well. We're just wrapping up there with just uh, a few maybe a couple of weeks away from finishing the Fight the Future Minute, which is a X-Files film, the Fight the Future, out in 1998, where um, the X-Cross crew have been going through that minute by minute, day by day over the summer. And so we're just about to finish that up, um, coming up soon. Um, so those are the best two places at this moment in time, at time recording, to, to come and find me as well. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Matt, again, for coming on. Uh, it's time for us to set a course and uh, you can take the blue midget this week. I'll take Starbug. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll see you next week. And but until next time, remember everyone. <laughs> Elsewhere, and we made this pretty fly. A nineties nostalgia podcast. I dropped out of college. You know, like is that really like, what this this episode's about? You just need to to work through that today, or yeah, like this is cheap therapy for me. Um, if you can, if you can, if you can, if you can abide. Uh, no, like I, I how does, I how does that make you feel? <laughs> Look, to, like, and to like to answer the uh, question honestly, I, I think it kind of holds up a, a little bit of a mirror to me and, and makes me realise that maybe I haven't done everything that I wanted to do with my life. Cerebral jukebox. You're saying it hadn't been recorded yet, it was purely yeah. a sort of live number. Yeah. Uh, do you think that that's what stuck it more in your head because you didn't have the recording to fall back on? Well, yeah, I, I think that, that I think it taps into the the essence of why songs can be super annoying. Um, <laughs> because it's, it's about an exorcism thing. Um, I was chatting to my wife uh, earlier about doing this podcast and she said that she, she always has a, a kind of, she, she gets a flush song. Frame to frame. On the subject of Hercules, that was one of the films that I really, really had in mind watching this. Because this was the first time I'd watched it. And I think not just the, the trope of having who were effectively the muses in, in Hercules, 
having those people that are there singing the songs and being able to sort of set the scene that was one aspect of it but the, musically it just there were certain songs and riffs that sounded very similar and, and very similarly influenced well I'd, I'd be very surprised if Mankin's work on Hercules wasn't influenced by Little Shop of Horrors I mean on Hercules you've got the gospel it's the gospel choir isn't it and I think there is certainly an, an underlying gospel influence in Little Shop of Horrors in as much as gospel underpins a lot of soul and, and Motown uh, music check out all of these shows and more on the We Made This podcast network Shipwrecked and Comatose, a Red Dwarf podcast, was created and produced by Mark Adams and Kurt North. You can find us on Twitter at Red Dwarf Pod, and we are part of the We Made This Podcast Network, which can be found online at WeMadeThisPod.com or on Twitter at WeMadeThisPod. <laughs>